This mountain of rubble is a monument to the 1,100 lives lost here last April. When this garment factory collapsed in Bangladesh, unleashing the stories that had long been locked inside. A thousand people died. No one said a thing. Do you recognize these shorts? We meet the people who make your clothes and find out where those clothes were made. This is your address. This is where this came from. The truth that retailers don't want you to know. You've been hit. You've been hit. You've been hit. Do any of you worry that one day you may die in your factory? Dangerous factories and dark secrets. Hi, I'm Mark Kelly, and welcome to the Fifth Estate. I'm standing by the rubble of what was once Rana Plaza. When the eight-story factory collapsed in April, a frantic search for survivors began. So too did the search for answers. How, the world wondered, could a disaster like this happen? Well, we joined that search when we learned many of the victims died here, making clothes for Canadian consumers. Along the way, we uncovered this ledger pulled from the rubble. And using the information inside here, we spent months piecing together clues that would reveal how and where your clothes are being made. And what we would also discover is the disaster that happened here was no accident. Fashion is built on an image of beauty, glamour and style. Creations that not only make you look good, but feel good. Clothes without a conscience. The reality of the fashion industry is far less glamorous. A reality Canadian retailers don't want you to know about. It's known as the race to the bottom, where the cheapest prices win. A race that created fast fashion. And that's why today, many of your clothes bear the label made in Bangladesh. It was that glamour of the fashion industry that spoke to Sajit Senek, even as a teenager growing up in the suburbs of Toronto. I'm from a South Asian family. My father's a doctor, um, and they wanted me to sort of follow that, follow that path. Um, I was super creative, so it was a way for me to say, hey, listen, there's a job for me. It's an actual commercial career. He went to couture school and turned a dream into a dream job, designing for Christian Dior and Balenciaga in Paris. It was like a fish finding a pond. It gave me a way out, uh, a way to, you know, lead my own life. It gave me my freedom and uh, it gave me everything. But the growing popularity and increasing demand for fast fashion led him back to Toronto to design $20 blouses for Walmart. Instead of Paris, his fashion focus was Bangladesh. There was a natural flow towards Bangladesh because of, of fast fashion in the last in the last ten years, and trying to get tr trying to get clothes cheaper and cheaper. But I think when the recession hit, I think people just ran for the price. It was you know it was Mecca, it was Mecca. But the road to Mecca decimated Canada's garment industry. From 2001 to 2010, 75,000 jobs were lost here. Many deep-rooted manufacturers had a stark choice, move or close. My great-grandfather was a rag dealer. He used to go from Sherbrooke to Montreal uh, in a horse and buggy, buying rags uh, from the farmers. Barry Laxer's family has been in the garment business in Montreal and Toronto for three generations, but he was forced to pack it all up for price. My single largest customer that at the time in Canada accounted for over 50% of our volume told us that to continue doing business we needed to find a lower cost uh, manufacturing base somewhere else. And that was Bangladesh? It turned out to be Bangladesh. Yeah. Companies around the world were now beating a path to Bangladesh. From H&M to Walmart, Nike and The Gap. Barry Laxer joined that garment gold rush. Today, his company, Radical Designs, runs two factories outside Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh. 
at least half machines in this factory all came from Canada. But we had like 80 containers of machinery that came here. And just rushed it over here to do business. Oh, uh, we just learned it wasn't doing anything in Toronto. Now he employs more than a thousand people, and he pays them three times the minimum wage. When you own a factory, nothing is better than walking through it and seeing it full. And busy. And, and busy, yeah. You built quite an empire here, Barry. What's the allure for companies to come to Bangladesh? The only real allure is, is labor. Uh, the workers will work for wages that most countries won't because there's no alternative. Working for next to nothing is better than working for nothing. In real terms, next to nothing is $38 a month, or 24 cents an hour, the lowest garment worker wage on the planet. The floodgates for Canadian businesses opened when Ottawa dropped import duties from Bangladesh in 2003. Canadian companies like Lululemon, HBC and Walmart Canada climbed aboard the Bangladeshi bandwagon. The result? Imports grew by 618%. Some say the front runner in the race to the bottom was Loblaw's brand, Joe Fresh. These TV ads show the appeal of its cheap and cheerful kids' clothing line. The brand has bounced its way to one of the top spots in the children's wear market in Canada. Speaking to the CBC in 2010, the company president said he's just giving consumers what they want. They wanted fashion, and they wanted fashion that would play across the country, and they needed it at amazing price points. Joseph Mimran was now a fast fashion icon. But just how low could prices go? Well, look at this TV ad for Walmart. George? Clearly, the lower the better. Now more styles and more stylish, all at unbelievable prices, exclusively at Walmart. For designers like Sujit Senek, beauty took a backseat to price. What was the pressure that was put on you to make cheaper and cheaper clothes? Price is the starting point. It's, it's everything. It was down to, you got six buttons on your shirt, take it down to five. Can we take it down to four? Senek says he felt the pressure from retailers to cut costs, and so did the factory owners. They can't say no to, to 100,000 units. That means a very long time that the factory is going to be sitting idle if they don't get that, that order. So they needed you. They need you. They need you. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, that's not my decision. Mm -hmm. But, like, um, I started wondering, Mark, I really started wondering, how is it possible for clothing to be made at these low prices? It's a good question. Because while price was the priority, there were signs worker safety was not. In the decade before Rana Plaza, hundreds of people died in factory fires and building collapses in Bangladesh. Tragedy after tragedy, year after year, and no one in Canada seemed to notice. That changed on the morning of April 24th. The eight-story Rana Plaza collapsed. More than 1,100 people were killed. Hundreds are still missing, believed to be buried in the rubble. Tell me about what happened when you learned about Rana Plaza. It was like if you if you start having nightmares and then they become real. That was what, what, what Rana Plaza was for me. The search for survivors seemed to drag on and on. Sujit remembers being called into one particular meeting after the collapse, where profits were put ahead of people. We were in a room full of people when we were told that we were connected. And no one said anything. About a thousand people? A thousand people died. No one said a thing. They didn't, they didn't say anything about them. They just talked about their 
the loss in terms of units. How are they going to make up their margins? People were talking about that. And I sat there. I said nothing. Shame on me. Walmart was just one of dozens of companies that had used Rana Plaza. At the time of the collapse, the biggest factory in the building was making clothes for Joe Fresh. Their pink and red pants were found in the rubble, along with the bodies of the workers who made them. One week after the collapse, Joseph Mimran and Loblaw chairman Galen Weston faced the glare of the media. This has been uh, quite a tragic event. Um, and it's something that has touched all of our hearts. It's been uh, a very difficult uh, week for everybody. I'm troubled that despite a clear commitment to the highest standards of ethical sourcing, our company can still be part of such an unspeakable tragedy. But just how deep was that commitment to ethical sourcing? What did Canadian companies know about how their clothes were being made in Bangladesh? And what did they do to find out? Sujit wanted to find the truth, so he made a life-changing decision and quit his job. I thought, I don't want to be a part of this anymore. I can't be a part of this. So I, I, I stopped. When we come back, Sujit's journey. Are we sending people to factories knowing that there is a huge danger? And a teenaged garment worker who survived the collapse. Welcome to the Wild West of the global garment industry. Bangladesh has one of the world's densest populations, political instability and world-class corruption. And since the 90s, the economy has grown by double digits, fueled by fast fashion. Factories sit unfinished, just waiting for new floors to be added to accommodate new business. And every morning, scenes like this play out through the capital Dhaka as four million garment workers quietly file into work. They carry with them the memories of Rana Plaza, wondering if a tragedy like this could happen to them. The Rana collapse put Sujit Senek on a mission. The former fashion designer from Walmart Canada now wanted to learn the truth about how the clothes he designed were made. I had to find out for myself. Is this what my, my industry has been doing? Are we doing this on purpose? Are we sending people to factories knowing that there's a huge danger? Sujit traveled with us to Bangladesh. First stop, a residential neighborhood in Dhaka. An unlikely backdrop for the deadliest accident in the garment industry before Rana Plaza. This is Tazreen. It's massive. November 2012. Fire broke out in the Tazreen Fashion Factory a nine-story building, though the owner only had a permit for three stories. There were no fire escapes. Many doors were blocked by boxes. Windows were barred shut. Months before the blaze, the factory's fire safety certificate had been revoked. Most of the 112 victims here were burned alive. When the Tazreen factory fire happened, I was horrified. All these fingers were pointing all everywhere, and no one was saying, hey, listen, maybe, maybe we might have just a little bit to do with this. Walmart did indeed have something to do with this factory. Their faded glory shorts were pulled from the ashes. The company tried to distance itself from the tragedy, 
insisting Tazreen was not an authorized Walmart factory. There's bars on every single window. How are these people supposed to get out of here? There's no escaping. I wonder for you, CG, what, what does this building, what is this a symbol of to you? I think it's shame. We should be ashamed of ourselves to let something like this happen. How is it possible that people didn't know that this factory was built this way? This woman emerged from the crowd, the curious, to tell us her story, how workers knocked out a ventilation fan, and how she survived by jumping three stories to the ground. Will you ever work again? Will you ever have another job now after your injuries here? How am I supposed to work? I'm afraid to work and no one wants to take me. I cannot sit or lie down for a long time. I get better when I take medicine. But when I don't, it's painful. With few prospects, she appears as disposable as the fast fashion she once made here. This could have been one of my prints. You know, snakeskin's in. There it is. You know, it could have been a shirt, a dress. Hmm? Is it that important that you have to bar people into a building to, to meet our deadlines? It's not, not for me. It's disgusting. So how did Walmart's clothes end up at such a dangerous factory? An investigation by Walmart concluded one of its suppliers subcontracted part of the order to Tazreen without their permission. But how hard would it be for Canadian retailers to find out where their clothes are being made? We wanted to find out. So we bought a Walmart shirt in Canada that Sujit had designed. Shipping records led us to a factory on the outskirts of Dhaka. The record named the factory, Hassan Tanvir. Walmart publishes a list of banned factories in Bangladesh, factories that have failed the company's audits. And this factory has been on that list since June. We made repeated requests to visit the factory, but it wasn't until we showed up with our camera that the manager would even talk to us. Hi, I'm, my name is Mark. I'm from Canada. Yeah. Canadian Television. How are you? Okay, I'm fine. Great. We want to see where our clothes are being made and how they're being made. And that's why we came over here. I want to go inside and visit. But he wouldn't let us in. Instead, he passed us off to another manager. Have you made this here? We have a shipping record here that shows that it was made here. Hassan Tamdir, Fashion Works. This is your address. This is where this came from. Hello. He says he's never seen this before, doesn't recognize it, despite the fact that we've got the shipping record right here that shows it was in fact made right there at Hassan Tenbir Fashion Wares. Walmart puts it this way. They do make shirts here, but not our shirt. In fact, three months after blacklisting this factory, Walmart admits they are still making clothes here. One last order, they say. Since we couldn't get in to meet the workers, then we would take Sujit to meet them at home after work. This entire area here, everyone who lives here works in a garment factory. It's like a compound of garment factory workers. So we're gonna go and meet some of them tonight. Okay. And here they are tonight. Oh, wow. <laughs> These are nine people who work at the factory. All right. They asked us to hide their faces, fearing they'd lose their jobs simply for talking to us. I want to know, who are you making garments for now? 
inside the factory. Canada, Canada. 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 We hear that there's some problems working inside Hassan Tanvir. We've heard reports that there was a fire at the factory recently. Can they tell us what happened? When the fire really started to spread, all the workers started to protest. They broke the gates and escaped. They didn't want to let us out. They never want to let us out. They just want to turn off the lights and keep us in there and say, sit down, shut up, and work. Do any of you worry that one day you may die in your factory? Of course. of course. And it happens all the time. It happens yeah. regularly. Yeah, it's happened all the time. Every few days there is a fire. I want to know if, if you recognize this shirt, if any of you recognize having made this shirt over the past few months, is this something that you made in the factory? We showed them Sujit's shirt that we bought in Canada. Yeah, it's from the fifth floor. I made it when I used to work on the fifth floor. So she, she worked on this garment? Yes. I designed this garment. I drew this garment. Look, I did this. You put these two pieces together, so you put the sleeve in. Thank you. <laughs> How do you feel meeting the woman who made your design? I'm grateful to meet you. <laughs> I wanted to meet you. Um, it's nice to finally be able to see you and and tell you that i th i think that you should have a better life coming up why were joe fresh clothes being made in the death trap that was rana plaza we go inside a prison in bangladesh looking for answers Every piece of clothing we wear has a silent story stitched into it. The story of who made it and where. When Rana Plaza collapsed in April, those stories came spilling out. So did the clothes from the ill-fated factory ever make it to Canada? Well, we visited six stores in the Toronto area with a hidden camera three months after the Rana Plaza collapse. We found clothes made in Rana Plaza in store after store. So, I have a question. But you wouldn't know it by asking the sales associates. There was really, like, there was really only one product that we were making in that particular factory. It was like this line of pants that we did. We never ended up getting them. Like, obviously, like, we just, like, got rid of it and everything. It's doubtful that it was from that factory. Last stuff that was yeah. made in that place never even made it here. Loblaw's own shipping records reveal all these styles. Hundreds of thousands of garments were made in Rana Plaza before the collapse and sold in Joe Fresh stores this summer. So how did clothes for Joe Fresh end up being made in the death trap that was Rana Plaza? Well, that's a question we had for the factory owner. The problem is he's behind bars, charged with negligence in the deaths of the workers. So the Fifth Estate petitioned the Bangladeshi government for permission to speak with him. The government eventually agreed, but with one condition. Our camera would not be allowed inside the prison. As public outrage grew after the collapse, Basilis Adnan surrendered to police. His three factories occupied almost half of Rana Plaza. We arrived at Dhaka Central Jail, where he's awaiting trial. He began our interview saying how he'd parlayed an $8,000 loan from his dad in 1992 and turned it into a $15 million a year business 
thanks in large part to his best customer, Joe Fresh. Joe Fresh was my biggest client, about $6 million a year. That's why I was going bigger. He says he was eager to please his biggest client. So work had begun on Rana Plaza to add a ninth floor for his booming business. I asked whether he was under pressure to make clothes cheaper and faster. Everybody is doing this. They all squeezed me. But Joe Fresh was a very good customer. Their policy was just ship it on time. Before my time was up for the interview, I asked him to name one Loblaw employee who had ever visited his factory at Rana Plaza before the collapse. He couldn't. This ledger helps explain how that could happen. From the entries here, we learned Loblaw placed orders with a buying house in India called House of Pearl, who, in turn, placed Joe Fresh orders with the factory at Rana Plaza. House of Pearl, we learned, hired inspectors to check the quality of the clothes made in Rana Plaza, but not to inspect building safety. Outsourcing ethical responsibility to third parties enables companies like Loblaw to distance themselves from the work being done on the ground, according to our Canadian factory owner, Barry Laxer. You know, after Rana Plaza happened, there were all these retailers were saying, well, we didn't know. I mean, is that true? Do they not know what's going on in this country? A lot of companies just want cheap manufacturing, so they don't really look. Um, or ask the tough questions. Or ask the questions, because it's, if you don't ask the questions, you don't get the answers that you don't want to hear. Was the Rana Plaza collapse, was this, was this a wake-up call? I mean, do you really believe it's going to change anything here? I think in the end, a lot of companies are really just, look, are continuing just to look for margin and cost and, and... Ultimately, that's, what, that's why they're here, right? That's why they're here. Look, if, they, if, that, if that wasn't the issue, they could, be, they could be buying product made in the United States or Canada. We wanted to know more about the working conditions inside Rana Plaza. Who better to tell us than the people who work there? After the collapse, cameras captured this footage of survivors recovering in hospital. We were intrigued by this girl, who was trapped in the rubble for three days pinned under two dead bodies. She lost her mother as well as her leg. Both mother and daughter were making clothes for Joe Fresh. Months after the collapse, we finally found her. Her name is Arudi. She tells us she's 17, though her grandmother says she's really 15. A kid making kids' clothes for Canadians. Do you recognize these shorts? Like these shorts. Um, yeah, these pants were there. She sewed pocket seams, 150 pockets an hour. How do you feel when, when you look at those pants? I feel sad. If I didn't work in that factory, this would not have happened. I feel very bad seeing these pants. She says she's been working in the industry for three years, meaning she started when she was just 12. Like many women in Bangladesh, she felt it was her only hope. When I was little, I thought I would grow up, go to school, study and have a job. If you study, you have a job, a doctor, a teacher, you can have any job. But I couldn't do it. Because I'm poor, I have to work to eat. That's why I went into garment work. A Rudy shift was punishing, 12 hours a day, seven days a week. And when a rush order was placed, overtime was demanded. How did your bosses treat you and, and the other workers? If the others didn't know how to do the work, they used to yell and swear. If I can't work fast enough and meet the target, they will swear at me as well. I'd feel really bad.
She also remembers how cracks had been spotted inside Rana Plaza the day before the tragedy. The building was evacuated. She didn't believe the building owner, who insisted everything was safe just hours before the collapse. The next day, April 24th, her boss phoned her at home and ordered her to get back to work or she'd be fired. On that day that they told you to go back to work, were you afraid? Were you worried that that building was dangerous? There were many of us who didn't want to go, but they forced us. They said, don't worry, nothing will happen. If you die, we will die too. But they didn't go inside. They made us start work and then left. I was scared, but there was nothing I could do. If I stopped working, the line would stop and I would be in trouble. She and her fellow workers returned. An hour later, the building collapsed. Arudi was on the sixth floor. What do you remember about the, the moment the building collapsed? When it collapsed, I thought I wouldn't survive. Two dead bodies fell on my leg and my leg was stuck there. The roof fell on top of the bodies. I didn't know then that I would actually come out alive. Her family received some compensation from the government for the death of her mother and the loss of her leg. When asked what she received from Lobla, she told us she's still hoping. When we come back, we expose an even uglier side of the fashion industry in Bangladesh. Been hit. Hit, hit, been hit. Been hit. After the collapse of Rana Plaza, the Bangladeshi government scrambled to assure nervous retailers and consumers that the country was a safe place to do business. But even Loblaw, who had been making Joe Fresh clothes in this country for seven years, wondered how garment workers could be exposed to what it called unacceptable risk. So we took a closer look and discovered within three hours how easy it was to find the ugly side of fast fashion. A factory dumping technicolored wastewater directly into a river. A river that now runs black. Then we saw a jute factory with an open door that caught our eye. Inside, the air was thick with dust dust from a toxic dye. Yet no one here wore a mask. Within minutes, we were kicked out by the owner and his thugs. Finally, we went into one last factory with a hidden camera. Show you very good factory. I have room, I have everything in the one place. And found these children operating looms. One manager admitted some factory owners hire kids under the age of 10 for menial jobs and pay them about a dollar a day. The garment industry has made some people in this country fabulously rich. But poverty is still everywhere you look. Some of the poorest are these squatters who live next to the railway tracks in the shadow of wealth. This gleaming tower is home to the BGMEA. That's the business group that represents the titans of the garment industry in Bangladesh. We arrived to find a thousand angry workers protesting outside. They say they haven't been paid by their employer in a month. They work for a factory that until last fall made clothes for Canadians. So what happened? Shit, shit. You've been hit. You've been hit. You've been hit. You've been hit. 
You've been hit. You've been hit. Who did this? Who did this? Many, many, many. Who? The owners hired gangsters. Yes, yes, gangsters. And the gangsters came out. And what were you doing? You were just protesting? Yes. You were protesting because you wanted your, yes. your back wages. Yes. You wanted your pay. Yes. And you make, you make clothes for Canada? Yes. We had some questions for the powerful head of the garment industry, the top man Canadian retailers deal with. Atikal Islam is a prominent factory owner in his own right. He's made clothes for Walmart Canada, Loblaw and HBC. I asked him about the protest outside his window. This is completely open industry. If you don't like there, you can go the other work there. We have a 25% worker shortage in the industry. Still today. Working in other words, if workers are abused, his advice? Quit and work somewhere else. When I ask him about the bad factories we saw, the child labor, the pollution, the dangerous working conditions, he wasn't alarmed. A lot of factories of the state of the art. We've seen the nice ones. We've seen the state of the art. We're seeing the example uh, of where the industry is moving. Yes. But you're, you're at a point right now where there's some shining yeah, no, examples. Some, but so for that, sometimes the shine is covered by the cloud mm -hmm. of this kind of things. So we need to uh, clean the cloud. But what about illegal subcontracting when one factory gives orders to another without approval? If the factories have the overbooked, they must say, no, I'm overbooked. And as well as the from the outside also, the retailer side also. But they you're, you're a businessman. Are they, are they really going to say I'm overbooked and I can't take the business? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Everybody yeah. wants no, the no, business. No, 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 it's not like that. It is not like that. Things are completely changed. It is not like that. We had spoken with some sources who worked for Walmart Canada. Mm -hmm. They placed an order with your group. Mm -hmm. And they said that that order then ended up being made at a factory that was not approved. Hassan Tanvir. Hassan? Hassan Tanvir. Remember that Walmart shirt? Well, we had some questions about who exactly made it. Take a look. We showed it to the workers there and they said, yep, they made it. It is very difficult for me to know this, whether I'm making it this number one. And number two, there's no way that we're giving the goods to outside. There's absolutely no way. Our all garments has made in our factory. But Walmart told us Mr. Islam did indeed have the contract to make Sujit's shirt, but at his own factory, not Hassan Tanvir. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll take that. You don't need that. Can I just, I just oh. want to see this one. Yeah. Please just have it sit on it. Absolutely. And then something extraordinary happened after our interview wrapped up. Look in the background as Mr. Islam conceals the garment behind his desk with a pen in hand. After we left, we noticed the tag on the shirt had been defaced. The barcode and the Canadian import number that could connect this shirt to Atikal Islam's company were blacked out. We asked him the next day if he did it. He denied it. As for Loblaw and Joe Fresh, the Canadian company insists it will help lead the way to clean up the industry in Bangladesh. Our industry can be a force for good. Properly inspected, well-built factories play an important role in the development of countries such as Bangladesh. Did Loblaw properly inspect Rana Plaza before the collapse? They say they did visit the factory. So why were they still making clothes there? Well, that's what we wanted to ask Joe Mimran, but we were told he wasn't available for an interview. I'm troubled by the deafening silence from other apparel retailers on this issue. And while Loblaw CEO Galen Weston publicly criticizes other companies for their deafening silence, he declined to be interviewed for this story. Loblaw did send us an email outlining their efforts to help workers in Bangladesh. They say since the collapse, they've contributed a million dollars to two charities and joined a compliance accord with other retailers aimed at improving working conditions in Bangladesh. And the company will now put boots on the ground somewhere in the region to inspect factories.
But there's another way. Canadian factory owner Barry Laxer wanted a safe factory, so he built one. It's run by a Canadian team. And he visits it regularly. But what are the effects then of paying the cheapest possible price in a country like Bangladesh? Sooner or later, there'll be another Rana Plaza. It's just a matter of time. Sooner or later, there'll be another fire somewhere uh, that will claim more lives. Because Bangladesh is just the floor and the testing ground for how cheap products can be sold. Before former Walmart designer Sujit Senek left Bangladesh, we had one more stop to make. There's one last thing I wanted to show you before you go. This is where Rana Plaza once stood. Oh my God. There's nothing left. There are people walking around in Canada wearing clothes that were made by these people who died here. This is kind of a monument to greed. This is a product of the race to the bottom. So what are consumers to do? Boycott clothes made in Bangladesh? Well, the jobs are pulling millions of women out of poverty. Like a Rudy, who despite her loss, knows she has to go back to work. Especially now that her mother is gone and she'll have to support her younger sisters and her grandmother. Do you want to go back and work inside a, a garment factory now? If I wanted to work in the factory, it's not possible to walk back and forth and go up and down the stairs. I can't do it yet. That's the issue now. I will be able to go back, but I'm afraid. Well, after watching tonight's episode, you may be wondering more about the clothes you buy and how they were made. Well, for some of the brands and lines of clothing that we mentioned on tonight's program, you can find out more information by going to our website. That's at cbc.ca slash fifth. And of course, we'll continue to update that website with developments on this story in the weeks and months ahead. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this. <laughs>